Yeah, we we have job security. That's for sure. <laughs> All right, Jen, I'm going to start in 30 seconds. Got it. And Jen, at the end, I'll have you wrap up with Dr. Okon Kuo. I'll have you wrap up uh, in case I'm in a dead zone or something like that. No problem. Appreciate it. All right, well, welcome everyone to another Thursday uh, Grand Rounds for our Department of Internal Medicine, the Roy Benke Grand Rounds. Uh, so again, thank you for all the feedback on what has been a very successful Grand Round season so far. Uh, we have a, a return speaker, uh, and we always love those this year, Dr. Okon Kuo from the Department or the Division of, of uh, Emergency Medicine. Uh, last year, Dr. Okon Kuo gave us an excellent talk uh, on arrhythmias, and this year she's bringing a very important topic to Grand Rounds. Uh, um, and so she's going to introduce her team, uh, and uh, from there, uh, we will um, uh, go into our panel discussion. And we're, again, really, really grateful for the work of this group to bring this important topic forward. So without further ado, uh, uh, Dr. Okon Kuo uh, from our Division of Emergency Medicine, welcome back. Welcome back to Grand Rounds, and I'll turn over uh, the introductions to you at this time. Thank you. I'm an ER doctor here at Tampa General. Um, one of my favorite things about my job actually here at TGH is the opportunity we have to participate in quality improvement. So one of my areas of focus has been on improving the care of patients who present following sexual assault and following uh, intimate partner violence um, situations. So it's an honor to be here and talk to you guys and educate you a little bit more during this month. It is uh, Intimate Partner Violence Awareness Month, so thank you for having me. I did bring with me a team today. Let me see if we can fancy slides. So these people are people I've worked with over the last couple of years, actually, who have been instrumental in helping us improve our care of patients here at Tampa General, but also at throughout the county here in Hillsborough County. So let me introduce this team to you. Jim Schmidt is actually the Director of Public Education for Hillsborough County Fire Rescue, which is one of the largest fire departments here in the state of Florida. Jim also happens to be one of the founders of the Gabby Petito Foundation. He's going to be sharing in a little bit uh, some of his personal story and a call to action um, for our providers. Jen Thayer will be speaking next. And Jen is the director of nursing at the Crisis Center, which is our sexual assault referral um, center here in Hillsborough County. She'll be talking about uh, intimate partner violence and why strangulation is of particular importance to this group and hopefully to all of you after this lecture. I'll give an overview of the medical evaluation of patients following strangulation. And then Tanil Mislicki will be our last speaker. Tanil is the Director of Coordinated Community Response for the Springs, which is our domestic violence shelter here in Hillsborough County. So um, with that, let me share with you our group objectives. By the end of this lecture, you'll be able to define intimate partner violence and know the difference between IPD and domestic violence. Hopefully you will recognize why this is not just a, an issue between individuals in a relationship, and it really is an issue that affects our community and our society and our country as a whole. It's a true public health concern. You'll understand the risk associated with strangulation and how to appropriately work up these patients from a medical standpoint. You're gonna gain some communication skills that hopefully will improve your care that you provide to these patients when we talk about trauma-informed language. And you'll know more about the resources we have in our community so that you can empower these patients. So with that, I'm going to share a video and turn it over to Jim in just a minute. Petito. Gabby Petito. A witness called officers after seeing the couple get physical. And I'd like to report a domestic dispute. Officers stopped short of calling it a domestic dispute. No charges were filed. <laughs> Today, human remains 
Sheriff discovered, consistent with the description of Gabrielle Gabby Petito. We hereby find the cause and manner of death to be the cause of death by strangulation. Uh, welcome, Jim, to give us our call to action. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I uh, want to thank you all for uh, having me on today and uh, to our team for uh, in including uh, Gabby's story as part of this training. Uh, as Dr. Okonkwo said, my name is Jim Schmidt, and I currently work for Hillsborough County Fire Rescue. I'm a training specialist in our fire prevention and public education division here. And prior to my time at Hillsborough County Fire Rescue, I worked for over 20 plus years as a fire officer and an EMT uh, in New York. It was a career that I was uh, passionate about, I enjoyed greatly, and a career that ended abruptly due to uh, the horrific event. Over the years, I've, I've responded to many uh, traumatic calls for service, and we often learn to deal with those situations and often feel we can handle almost anything that life throws at us. And that all changed for me. And, and my family in 2021, when our daughter Gabby Petito was brutally strangled to death and left in the wilderness by a person that we thought loved and cared for her. Doing like any good father would do, any first responder, um, when she went missing, I immediately reacted and I said I would find her and I would bring her home no matter where she was. On September 19th of 2021, she was located by the Teton County Search and Rescue Team. I had to positively identify her remains and call home to my wife and children and tell them I wouldn't be bringing her home. That day haunts me to this very day. At that moment, I was over 2,000 miles away from home and I was unable to hold my wife or my kids to provide some type of comfort. I could only listen to screams and crying on the other end of the phone. No family should ever experience what we went through and nobody deserves to have their life taken from them the way Gabby did. We made the decision to turn our tragedy into purpose and to advocate for victims and survivors of domestic violence. Uh, some of the social media sites that we had utilized to help try to find Gabby, we began receiving messages after her, uh, her funeral service uh, from survivors, from people who were experiencing similar situations with domestic violence, saw her story and recognized they needed to find a safe way out. And that inspired us to start our foundation. The training you're about to receive, it focuses on non-lethal strangulation and how physicians and nursing staff can make a difference for a patient who has been strangled, a term they often refer to as being choked. A person who has been strangled by an intimate partner has a 750% higher chance of being murdered by that same partner. It's not a matter of if, but when. The course today is going to cover uh, some basics of domestic violence awareness, recognizing some of those signs and symptoms, how to use a trauma-informed approach when interviewing the patient, documentation of your encounter with them, and available resources for the victim. Your interaction with a victim of domestic violence could be that catalyst to help break that chain of violence and save their life. And I just want to say, all of our interactions, no matter how big or how small you feel your role might be uh, in that interaction and in that encounter with the victim of domestic violence, it matters. The goal is to instill hope in them, trust, safety, and that they are being heard. It only takes one negative interaction along that way to diminish all of that. Your interaction with them matters and it is important. And I just wanna thank you all for being here and I hope you get a lot out of this course. And I wanna to say together, and that key word is together, all steps along the way, we can make a positive difference in these survivors' lives. I want to thank you all for allowing me to be here. And next up, you have uh, Jen Thayer. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you again for having us. Um, as Dr. Okonkwo said, I am the Director of Nursing at the Crisis Center of Tampa Bay. 
which is the Certified Rape Crisis Center for Hillsborough County. Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit at the beginning about how we all ended up coming together as a group and um, what our you know, main goals were uh, for developing this training and several other trainings that we've done um, as a group together. Back in 2020, um, there was a group of us, a multidisciplinary group of us that attended the advanced strangulation training through the Training Institute on Strangulation Prevention. A lot of what you'll hear today comes from their, um, their work and their um, research as well. Um, we were part, all part of the um, coordinated community response team that Danielle, you'll hear from later, um, manages um, and the Domestic Violence Task Force as well. So with being the, the Rape Crisis Center of Hillsborough County, the domestic violence um, organization for our county as well. And then of course, some, uh, we added a couple people from the um, state attorney's office to take this training. When we got back and we finished the training, we, we really recognized that there was a need in Hillsborough County for more education, more training and a countywide strangulation protocol. We really wanted to uh, primarily improve the care for victims, but also to inc increase the prosecution rates of the perpetrators. So we began by creating a strangulation task force um, as sort of a subcommittee to that uh, to the domestic violence task force. Um, and we invited other first responders like Jim and other uh, service providers and healthcare providers and victim advocates and attorneys to join us. So that's who you're gonna be of course hearing from today is the rest of our the rest of our team, if you will. Um, and we really, again, the whole purpose is to really just be come together, like Jim said, um, as a united front and uh, come up with a strategic plan in terms of how we're going to respond to such tragedies in our community. I wanted to take just a minute because you will hear a lot of people say, uh, in, talk about intimate partner violence or IPV, but they'll also talk about domestic violence or DV. And I wanted to talk about these and sort of show the difference between them because we do use the words and the phrases quite interchangeably frequently, especially in healthcare, um, and, but they actually are two different terms and they have two different meanings. Domestic violence, when you think about that, is the violence that takes place within a household and can be between really any two people within that household. So domestic violence doesn't necessarily have to be between uh, intimate partners. It can be between siblings. It can be a parent and a child. Um, it could even be roommates that live together. As opposed to intimate partner violence is exactly what it sounds like. It is. It can only occur between romantic partners. So they may or may not be living in the same household. As um, Dr. Okonkwo said in her introduction, intimate partner violence is a public health concern. It often starts early and continues throughout a person's life. If you think about uh, teen dating violence, for example, it affects millions of teenagers uh, every year. And these individuals often get stuck in this repetitive abusive situation. Uh, victims of IPV often experienced increased rates of depression, PTSD. We often see uh, chronic disease in these, uh, in these survivors, and they also sometimes engage at high-risk behaviors. About one in three women and about one in four men have reported experiencing some sort of severe physical violence from an int intimate partner at some point in their life. This certainly isn't unique to any sort of culture, any profession, any socioeconomic status. It really does affect all groups. Some sort of red flags as a healthcare provider that you can certainly look out for include inconsistent injuries. And what I mean by that is the history that they provide to you doesn't really align with what you're seeing in terms of their injuries. Maybe you're seeing them frequently in your offices or return visits to the ER. They may not make the best eye contact or they talk to you with their heads down as if they're ashamed of something. They might describe their wounds and their um, injuries as self-inflicted or blaming themselves. Maybe they are explaining that they were clumsy and they fell down the stairs. We often see depression, even suicidal ideations. 
Um, another red flag would be if their partner's at the bedside at all times. Sometimes they, uh, we find that they speak for them and they answer all of the questions, but they, and they actually won't leave the bedside throughout the visit. Sometimes we'll see associated substance abuse um, in, in victims of IPV. And also when you think about a pregnant patient, do they have any sort of isolated abdominal injuries? You're gonna see this statistic quite frequently, frequently throughout the entire um, presentation today. And it's something that is, is so alarming. Being strangled increases a victim's chances of being killed by that same intimate partner by 750%. That's pretty alarming. We'll talk about that a lot. People who strangle others are unequivocally the most dangerous people. When you look at uh, what mass shooters, people who kill police, law enforcement officers, uh, domestic terrorists, and individuals that kill their significant others have in common, it is typically a history of childhood trauma and a history of prior strangulation assault. Two other terms that I would like to take just a minute to define. Um, again, they're often used interchangeably um, and a lot of times the victims are gonna use the word choking versus strangulation. As you all know, strangulation is a form of, of asphyxia that results when there is pressure applied to the external neck causing the collapse of blood vessels um, and or the airway. It may result from manual pressure, ligature or hanging. As opposed to choking, when choking is actually internal, right? It could be a block, it, there could be a blockage of food or um, some sort of foreign object lodged in the trachea. So something that could easily be remedied by the Heimlich maneuver, for example. So again, just making sure that those two words are being used correctly. And lastly, I just wanna take a minute to talk about that terminology some more in terms of your, your documentation and how you're charting. Use the word strangulation, not choking, right? Um, they, uh, you can also use the phrase non-fatal strangulation. Those are the survivors that we're going to be seeing and that you will be seeing in your offices and in your, uh, in your practices. Don't use the word choking. Don't use the word near strangulation or attempted strangulation. Um, the other word that is always um, helpful to avoid using is allegedly. Allegedly is actually a legal term, a term, not a medical term. And so keeping that out of your documentation is really key. When you're treating and seeing these victims or survivors, you want to make sure that you are remaining completely objective. You want to try to be as consistent as possible and use the medical terminology that you would use for any other descriptive description of any other injury or um, history that is provided. Use the words like abrasion and bruise. Dr. Okonkwo is going to get into this much more for you in the upcoming slides. Try to avoid using things like ligature mark. We don't necessarily know that it's a ligature mark or a scratch even because it's not, we don't know that it was a, an actual scratch. And also limit the details of the assault. Um, it's, it's really not our field to determine if an assault happened or not, whether somebody's guilty or not, whether you know what they're saying is true. It really is just a matter of documenting what your what your findings are um, and what your impression is based on what the history that was provided and what you see on your physical exam. The details of the assault are not necessary in your doc documentation. Unfortunately, when we give too much information, there could oftentimes be inconsistencies in maybe the victim story versus what we wrote in the chart versus what law enforcement wrote. And so therefore we're at higher risk for a failed conviction. So a great example is listed here at the bottom of the slide, a 23 year old female presenting for assault with strangulation complaining of X, Y, Z. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Okonkwo now and she's gonna to talk to you about the, um, all of the medical stuff. And I realize this is a busy slide, but it's a great slide to come back to because it walks through the things that you should be looking for and thinking about as you evaluate these patients. And some of these things are really obvious. I know if I'm um, evaluating a patient who's been strangled, of course, I'm going to be looking at the neck for signs of abrasions, bruising, any kind of airway involvement. But you may not be familiar with some of the other findings or symptoms that patients experience, um, such as scalp petechial lesions or 
um, mucosal uh, petechial lesions. That may not be something you've thought of. Even something like tinnitus can be uh, a concerning uh, symptom that they're experiencing as a result of strangulation that might indicate a cervical dissection, for example. Um, it's also really common for these patients to come in with vague neurologic complaints. So they'll tell you, you know, they just have like severe generalized fatigue. They may even keep their eyes closed on exam. They may tell you that they feel somewhat confused um, and have difficulty recalling things. And as providers, we can kind of misper misperceive that as thinking that they are trying to protect someone or they're fabricating something or they just don't want to cooperate with our exam. When the truth is, all of those things can be a direct consequence of the strangulation and the early anoxia that they've experienced. So it's important that we recognize that. We're going to come back to many of these findings. I'm going to show you some real life examples um, in the upcoming slides, but please save this slide and take a look at it if you ever encounter this. So I am an ER doctor by training. So of course my brain works with figuring out what are the emergent things I need to think about in this situation. And I break this down into three major categories that I consider. Number one, am I dealing with an airway or breathing emergency? Number two, is this a neurologic emergency or an impending neurologic emergency? And lastly, what is this person's risk of death? And that risk of death, that risk stratifying part is something as an ER doctor, I do subconsciously basically for all of my patients, whether it's the chest pain patient that I've determined is safe for discharge home, or it's the leg infection that's like a severe sepsis going to the ICU, I'm always thinking about what is their risk of mortality? What is their morbidity from this? The same should be true for these patients. And when you look at the age-matched cohorts, um, their risk of death is much, much higher. So I just, just ask you to pause and think about that for a minute. If I had told you that that chest pain patient's risk of death was 750% higher, you would want to make sure that patient had appropriate workup and a safe uh, follow-up plan. So the same is true for these patients. We want to make sure we know how to medically evaluate them. We provide them with resources that increase their chances of being safe and decrease that risk of mortality and morbidity. So we're going to get into the airway and breathing emergencies in a minute. Let's talk just overview of kind of consequences of strangulation. So what are they? Well, if a person's bilateral carotid arteries are occluded, they tend to lose consciousness between five and 10 seconds. Around 14 seconds or so, a noxic seizure has been reported. Between 15 and 30 seconds, loss of bowel and bladder function can occur. Petechial lesions tend to show up anywhere between 10 to 30 seconds. And obviously not everyone's gonna go through this full spectrum, but these are common things that have been um, reported. At the one minute mark, this is where things start to get really grim and patients begin to die. When you extend that out past the two minutes, um, respiration basically ceases for everyone um, and very few survivors at that point. So this is just a basic slide reviewing some general anatomy. I'm sure you guys probably all know this, but we're gonna go over the airway stuff specifically uh, in just a few more slides. But I wanted to just point out a physical exam finding that you may not think of in the setting of strangulation that's directly related, and that's the presence of petechial hemorrhage. So remember your carotids, you know, delivering the oxygenated blood, your jugular is removing the blood. If you actually occlude the jugular vein, that's going to uh, increase the, the pressure at the level of the arterioles and venules, and that blood can rise to the surface. And it can be quite impressive, especially if there's still some arterial flow there driving that pressure up. So that's one of the findings um, that you may see. Now, this slide is probably the most important slide that I'm going to share with you, and that is that 50% of patients that have been strangled have no external signs of injury. That does not mean that they don't have some hidden underlying badness. So the truth is you cannot trust just your physical exam on these patients. And how do we know this? Well, we know this from um, most of the work as uh, and evidence has been done by Gail Streck and Dean Holly. They looked at 300 uh, cases of strangulation. And even when patients were strangled to death, so even on the autopsies, only about half had external signs of injury. So keep that in mind. Now, if you do see injury patterns, what are you going to see? What are you looking for? And how do you document it? Let's walk through some, some real life examples. The pictures that I'm about to show you um, come from either the Strangulation Training Institute, some are from the Family Justice Center, and then some of our uh, local patients have actually given us permission to share their images as well. So abrasions are probably the most common thing that you're going to see. 
And um, when you document this, again, our job is to be as objective as possible. So we want to say, uh, for example, there's an abrasion to the right lateral neck measuring X centimeters. If you can take photos when possible, that's gonna be helpful. Don't forget to look at the posterior neck. This is also a really common area where um, you may see something like half moon abrasions, which are very specific for you know, fingernail markings. And this may be self-inflicted where the person's trying to free themselves or it may be from the attacker. Again, our job in the chart is, is not to say consistent with you know, strangulation. We don't say that. We would describe it as this and let the forensic experts be the ones to link that. But um, I would describe this as saying several half moon abrasions or, or abrasions exterior neck. Just want to mention also that dark can be a little bit trickier to see some of these abrasions. Make sure you've got good lighting and come back and see these patients. You know, if you can, um, come back and see these patients again, reassess them uh, because sometimes it shows up over a period of, you know, an hour or so. It may be a lot darker than when you first saw them. Can you guys hear me okay? I'm getting that message that I have like poor network quality, so bear with me. Hopefully we're good. Um, this is a good. more dramatic, good, okay. This is a more dramatic case where these are actually self-inflicted. Now, it's, it's terrifying to think about, but if someone's, you know, strangling you, you're desperately going to be trying to free yourself. So linear abrasions is how I would document this. So you'd say numerous linear abrasions to the anterior neck, chest, and chin. Um, though these are consistent with a self-inflicted um, manner, we wouldn't write the word self-inflicted in the chart. Okay, ovoid bruising patterns are very suspicious for fingertip bruising patterns. So again, describe this exactly as it is, you know, circular ovoid shaped bruising to the anterior neck measuring X centimeters. And these can look a little different depending on what stage you uh, catch the bruising in, they can be a little different. They may come to you a couple days after the assault and, and it can look different. Um, one thing I would caution against is anytime you, let's say you have a teenager and you see something like this on the neck, don't assume it's a hickey. Always, always, always get that person al alone and ask them if they're safe. Okay, this is an example of a ligature pattern. So when patients are, uh, or individuals are strangled, most commonly that is done manually, meaning, you know, someone's put their neck or their hands around their neck, or maybe they've even been put in a headlock or the forearm pushed against them. Um, but sometimes uh, instruments are used like necklaces, you know, ropes, belts, um, used to be phone cords, but thankfully that doesn't exist anymore. Um, and that creates a, a ligature pattern. And when you document this, you would document it as a circumferential abrasion. Um, don't call it a ligature pattern. All right, this is an example of the uh, petechial hemorrhage that I was talking about that you can get with compression of the, the jugulars. So it can be really impressive, like the case on the left, or more subtle, where you just see some scattered lesions above the eye and to the nose. Um, don't forget to look for these lesions also in the oral mucosa. So this is important for two reasons. Uh, number one is the patient's safety. So right behind, you see this tiny, tiny little petechial hemorrhage here. Right behind there is where you're carotid. Sets. So you want to look and evaluate for hidden underlying injury. Um, but secondly, you know, our medical chart is actually the most successful piece of evidence when this, uh, if this case ever goes to um, trial. So our job, again, we're not determining guilty or not, but you, you do have, um, I think, a obligation to be educated and know what you're looking for, what you need to document. So be familiar with the injury patterns, and this would be uh, consistent with that. Subconjunctival hematomas occur very similar to the petechial hemorrhage, can be impressive or more subtle. This is another bruising pattern that uh, it always reminds me as an ear doctor of like a basal or skull fracture, but it's a slightly different type of bruising and a much different cause. So this is caused from torque on the neck. Um, the sternocleidomastoid muscle actually helps turn the neck and the insertion and origin points of that muscle can kind of have some tears at that area. So look for bruising behind the ears and above the base of the clavicles um, from, that, from that particular mechanism. 
One question I get is, do we need to place these patients in cervical collars? And in general, if it's limited strangulation, no. There have been reports of cervical fracture that can occur, but it's less common in um, isolated strangulation. Always just consider whatever other mechanisms they've experienced. So if they've been thrown down the flight of stairs and then strangled, of course, you might need a collar. Or if they have true midline tenderness to the neck, then maybe you do need a collar. But most of these patients do not require cervical um, collars. Let's move on to talking about the airway and breathing emergencies. So again, basic drawing, you probably know these things, but let's just review them because it's a really vulnerable area of the neck. Um, the neck in general has no protection over lying in it. So three is your hyoid bone. Four here is your thyroid cartilage. Five is your cricoid cartilage. Between the two, is that cricothyroid membrane. That's where an ER doctor would perform a crike if needed. Um, and then your trachea, of course, has tracheal rings. Um, all of these structures can be crushed and damaged and that be a true um, life-threatening injury. Not pictured here, but also important is the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which would run adjacent here. And that nerve gives rise to a branch that feeds uh, or innervates the muscle that opens and closes the vocal cords. So injury to that can be, you know, really minor, like some voice changes, or it can be um, pretty impressive respiratory distress, uh, especially if both sides are involved. So underlying neck hematomas are one of the biggest fears of strangulation and something that even as ear doctors, we don't like to deal with. Um, these can be, you know, uh, sudden onset kind of thing directly related to right after the injury, or they may be more delayed and slower progression, but either way can become scary. You can get a mass effect on the airway, which makes it uh, almost impossible, uh, depending on the size of that hematoma, for, for us to intubate orally. Um, it can be even difficult for us to get a surgical airway if there's a large hematoma in the way. So this is one of the reasons you've got to take it serious, even if you don't see overt swelling externally. If the patient's telling you they feel like their airway is closing, they feel like they're having, um, you know, difficulty breathing, um, those subjective symptoms may not be anxiety. It may be hidden underlying badness. So get imaging. Other types of airway injuries. If there's laryngeal injury, the clues generally are like uh, hoarseness of the voice, difficulty talking. If you hear strider, that is ominous. It's true, you know, potential airway emergency. We need to get them taken care of immediately. You may feel crepitus, so that rice crispy like feeling where there's air in the sub Q tissues. Tracheal deviation or deformity, obviously, that's a major problem. And um, they can have a variety of. Uh, a huge spectrum of respiratory distress, depending on the injury and if it's causing obstruction. Anytime we're ex expecting or suspecting laryngeal injury, these patients are gonna need a little bit more workup and a much more advanced approach. This is someone we would typically do a fiber optic look and see if we um, can appreciate any injury. This is someone we would get ENT involved. Obviously we're CTing their neck. So we take this very seriously because we wanna protect the airway uh, before we lose the airway. The recurrent laryngeal nerve, I already mentioned, that can be very mild, just some hoarseness that can be temporary to permanent to true vocal cord dysfunction, which can result in impressive respiratory distress. Um, if the hyoid bone becomes fractured, these patients typically will tell you that they're having difficulty swallowing or pain when they swallow. And sometimes it feels almost more internal, like a sore throat, but this would need imaging. Sometimes this requires surgical repair. But of course, uh, we're more worried about the other underlying structures that could be involved. So um, if there's an associated hematoma, for example, or damage to the, the trachea or the esophagus. One of the things that kills patients from strangulation um, is actually obstructive pulmonary edema. So you can imagine that the person is desperately trying to get air and they can generate really high negative inspiratory forces, and that can suck uh, fluid into the alveoli and result in obstructive pulmonary edema. I didn't mention it here, but another uh, common cause of respiratory distress would be aspiration related to it, where you get a pneumonitis. That can be progressive in nature. And then if they've had severe anoxic brain injury, you can also get um, a neurogenic pulmonary edema. So all of those can be delayed causes of death. Now, let's talk about neurologic emergencies. And in the context of strangulation, 
we're really talking about stroke that results from cervical dissections primarily. Remember, there are two arteries that feed the brain. So the internal carotid artery and the vertebral. And the internal carotid is gonna give rise to most of the big vessels that you're probably familiar with, your anterior cerebral artery, your MCA, you know, your ophthalmic artery, your posterior communicating artery, all those come off the internal carotid. The vertebral artery is responsible for the posterior part of the brain, the posterior circulation, we call it. So your brainstem, your cerebellum, um, the occipital lobe. And when a cervical dissection occurs, that basically means there's damage to the inner layer, that intimal layer of the vessel, and a false lumen begins to form. And this can result in stroke in a variety of ways, but uh, one way is you just create a clot at that level of injury, and then distal flow is affected. Another way would be a, a piece of that clot breaks off and you get an embolic stroke in that patient. Um, and it can land anywhere in the brain, depending on uh, the symptoms would change depending on where it's landed. And then one other way would be that false lumen can get so large and create a mass effect on the true lumen, and then blood flow is decreased as a result. Down at the bottom, it shows a pseudoaneurysm. That's one of the complications of dissection that can happen. And depending on the size, that may require uh, repair, endovascular repair. So Let's talk specifically about carotid dissection. So carotid dissection is a major cause of ischemic stroke in younger adults. So if we have someone coming in in their 30s and 40s, for example, having a stroke, carotid dissection is really high up on my differential for why they would be having this stroke. And the good news about carotid dissections is if you can detect it before the stroke has occurred, often you can prevent the stroke from ever happening. So, um, and, and the treatments actually to, to prevent stroke from happening, if you can find that dissection, the treatment's really simple usually. It's often an antiplatelet agent. So we're talking aspirin or Plavix usually for these patients. Depending on their risk factors, they may be put on full anticoagulation. Um, or if they have that pseudoaneurysm or something, they may require endovascular repair. But often it's as simple as an aspirin to prevent stroke. And this is a decision that if you ever detect a carotid dissection, uh, on someone you can discuss with neurology and neurosurgery what might be best for that particular patient. So again, um, in the setting of carotid dissection, the symptoms are gonna vary depending on where that clot actually lands. So um, it may be, you know, the eyes are involved because it hit the ophthalmic artery, or you could have a classic MCA stroke where the person's face and arm and leg are involved. Um, so keep that in mind. One thing that's a little counterintuitive uh, for some of us is in the setting of uh, a dissection that leads to a carotid dissection or a cervical dissection that leads to stroke, um, it's going to cause an ischemic stroke. And these are candidates for TPA if they present within the uh, appropriate window. They may also be candidates of thrombectomy as well. So we treat this type of ischemic stroke just like we would any other uh, ischemic stroke, really. And one point I want to drive home, and this is something that I talk about all the time with residents, is that when you have a cervical dissection, um, the symptoms of stroke are often delayed because the stroke itself is delayed. So it doesn't necessarily happen right after the injury. Though these patients are highest risk, you know, in the first couple of days to weeks after, there have been uh, reports of strokes reported in um, cervical dissections up to a year later. So if a person comes in a couple weeks after injury, uh, don't let just a reassuring physical exam make you think that no dissection has occurred because they still could be at major risk for stroke. So if we want to prevent stroke from happening, we have to recognize what dissection presents as. Well, the first big clue would be the history, some kind of mechanism. Strangulation is a major mechanism for this. So keep that in mind. These patients may need imaging. Um, but if they come in with symptoms, what are the common symptoms? Headache would be one of the most common symptoms. It is actually the most common presenting symptom. Neck pain is the second most common presenting symptom. And from an ER perspective, if someone doesn't have a history of headaches and then they're coming to me telling me like, oh, I have this new pain, it's here and it radiates up my head. You know, if they have neck pain and headache, um, I'm at least thinking about could they have a dissection leading to this pain. Dental pain is a common symptom where it's a referred type of pain. And then pulsatile tinnitus is, is also commonly reported. So they tell you, 
hey, I, I feel like I can hear my heartbeat in my ear or there's a ringing in my ear with every beat. Um, that's always concerning for a potential vascular etiology. About 5% of patients who experience a carotid dissection are gonna show up with this Horner syndrome um, physical exam findings. So remember that the carotid is located right next to a, a sympathetic plexus there. And if that's disrupted, you can get ptosis and meiosis on the ipsilateral side. So that's showing you an example here. A perfect test question for this where you should be answering, oh yeah, that's the carotid dissection, would be a 20-year-old female presenting with complaint of migraine and visual deficit, and she's noted to have ptosis on exam. That might be other things, but carotid dissection is pretty hard, high up on our um, differential. So let's talk about vertebral artery um, next. So the vertebral arteries are less commonly affected by strangulation, but they can be. They're more common than this half. So the action itself, like again, is common, and, and often it's posterior because the vertebrals themselves run posteriorly up the neck and, you know, to the uh, occipital area. So it's more common posterior neck, posterior head. Um, when they go on to have strokes, the biggest clue would be sudden onset. Anytime someone tells you it started suddenly, you should be thinking about vascular stuff. So these patients will have that with sudden onset vomiting, or they'll have a sudden onset vertiginous symptoms. They may have dysarthria. Um, they may have uh, sensory deficits, but no actual motor component. The motor component would be more rare to have in the setting of a vertebral um, dissection with stroke. So it's easier to miss is the bottom line. So be sure you're thinking about it. Classic case would be a 30 year old complaining of neck pain that radiates to the side of the head. And now they feel a little bit difficulty walking and feel dizzy. So the Strangulation Training Institute put together an imaging algorithm to help guide physicians on who needs imaging and who doesn't. And uh, again, it's because you can't trust your physical exam alone. We actually implemented an adapted version of this algorithm here at Tampa General that we use for our patients. So this is free online. You can find it. And again, we use something similar uh, here at TGH. The take home point is, you know, a lot of people are going to need imaging for this because it's something we don't want to miss. Um, the gold standard is the CT angio neck. Um, I know there are probably people out there that would argue if they're presenting with the stroke-like symptoms, an, an MRI would be the best option. But the truth is the biggest bang for our buck and the most time-effective thing that we have here at Tampa General is usually the CTA for these patients. I wanted to share just a little bit of our internal data. So um, part of my quality improvement work, again, has been looking at this area. And we looked at a, a little over 100 patients who had uh, been sexually assaulted and then the subset of those that were saying that they not only were sexually assaulted, but also experienced strangulation. And about 8.4% of those that were um, raped reported associated strangulation. We know this is a huge gross underestimate because of the nature of the quality improvement work. Uh, it was retrospective, so that would require not only um, physicians to report it, but the patient to tell them as well. Uh, and we weren't actively asking them, you know, were you strangled? I would actually encourage all of you, if you do experience uh, anybody sharing with you that they were sexually assaulted, always ask about any other injury and specifically ask about strangulation before you just refer them to, a, to the crisis center, for example. 55% of those who were strangled had no external signs of injury. That is consistent with the literature. Um, it's very similar to what's been re already reported. Unfortunately, only 22% of those patients received the appropriate CTA imaging. And this was part of the impetus for why we have an imaging algorithm to help guide our physicians. The last thing I want to say is just talking about blunt injury and traumatic brain injury. So I think the NFL has done a fantastic job making the public aware of the danger of repetitive head trauma um, of concussions. Um, but the truth is that the, the vast majority of individuals that we're going to deal with that have mild TBI are people that have experienced 
uh, domestic violence. And we know that TBI leads to decreased function, um, memory issues. You know, they may not be able to hold down the same job that they once could. Uh, there are a lot of psychiatric illnesses associated with TBI, everything from depression to PTSD to increased risk uh, for suicide, um, not to mention they have a lot of chronic morbidities and um, are more prone to bounce back to um, physicians and healthcare providers. So this is a huge cost really to our society um, to care for, for these patients. All right, with that, I want to turn it over to Tanil, who's going to be talking about the effects of trauma and collaboration. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. So pleased to be with you all today. Um, so I will be talking about the effects of trauma, and then we will be talking about collaboration and local resources um, briefly as we wrap up today's session. So first, um, these are the six guiding principles brought to us by the CDC. So to briefly review with you all, safety, trustworthiness and transparency, peer support, collaboration and mutuality, um, empowerment, voice and choice, and cultural, historical, and gender issues. So it's so imperative that you guys are assessing for this type of injury, um, but also understand that you're dealing with um, survivors of abuse. And so want to make sure that you're doing it in a trauma-informed way, of course, um, in order to not further traumatize the survivor and what they've already been through. So you all know what trauma is, um, but just to briefly review, you know, it's um, again, we're talking about for victims and survivors of abuse. So it's a set an, it's an event or a set of events um, from exposure to actual or threatened death, serious injury or violence. And of course, as it's already been stated, this will have a lasting effect on the individual's um, mental well-being, physical well-being, social, emotional, spiritual well-being, and more. Um, it's imperative to understand that trauma is a normal response to an abnormal event. So we all come with our own biases and whatnot. But if you haven't experienced trauma, you may not understand um, that the reactions to this trauma may look, look different for different people. Um, and again, just understanding that they're coming to you because they've experienced, you know, an illness or a medical incident, um, but they may also have experienced this trauma. Um, so to briefly review some of these effects of trauma, so we want to today talk to you guys about the cognitive. Uh, so these survivors, you know, may have a, an inaccurate recollection of what's just occurred to them. We do a lot of training in our CCR to law enforcement, and we just want to make sure that all our system partners understand that if a survivor is sharing with you something that's happened and they may not be remembering it in the order that it occurred, it doesn't mean that they're lying, they're being dishonest. Um, that could be a result of the trauma. It's also likely that they may completely disassociate in their interaction with you. So you're asking them questions and they're just somewhere else. This is also an effect of the trauma. And then of course they may be having disorientation, um, just attention difficulties and, and all of that um, due to what they've experienced. And then of course, emotional effects of the trauma, they may be quick to anger. Again, um, they may have been through this abuse before. They may have been in the medical setting before following the abuse and didn't get the care or service that they needed. And so they may have an inability to trust you, um, even if you are saying the right things or asking the right questions. Uh, so understanding that they may be more hypervigilant or easily startled. They also may be experiencing flashbacks as they're uh, sitting there and talking to you. And of course, as we've stated, if the abuser or the partner is in the room with them, um, th it may make them more hypervigilant or more anxious. So just understanding those dynamics as well. Some common perceptions of traumatic responses. So again, um, unfortunately, there's the perception and sometimes it's true that a survivor is reluctant or refusing to cooperate with the criminal justice system. And there's many reasons why a survivor may not want to uh, work with the 
criminal justice system. They may have tried to in the past and it made the situation more dangerous for them or the abuser wasn't held accountable. And so understanding that that's that survivor's right and we want to empower them to make that decision. So getting rid of the fear that you're going to call law enforcement if they report abuse to you, those types of things. Um, and again, remembering that they may have experienced multiple victimizations. And so uh, just always believing, going with always believing with what they're sharing with you. And then they may have some other um, things that are going on, of course, due to um, their situation. So just remembering that um, and doesn't mean they're overly needy uh, and just, you know, did the best to understand that they're experiencing a lot in that interaction. And so when we respond in a culturally attuned, trauma-informed, survivor-defined, person-centered ways, then people will feel safer talking about their experiences, more likely to access our services and find our services helpful. So we're talking about treating the whole patient. And so understanding due to the trauma that these survivors have experienced, what you say, of course, matters. And so um, we want to equip you and make sure you understand how to respond using trauma informed language. So shifting the questioning and mindset from what's wrong with you to instead saying what what's happened to you, um, making sure that you're listening empathetically and patiently and trying to ask open ended questions um, instead of going through like a checklist with them. You know, one question we hear a lot out in the medical community is, you know, that there's a checklist that's been implemented and that questions are asked, like, are you safe at home? But if you're not making eye contact with that person and showing body language that you're actually there to listen and you um, will provide them resources, uh, they, they're going to be less likely to disclose to you. So, of course, trauma-informed language will help build trust, create safety. It provides that transparency. It encourages and empowers. It gives the survivor that voice and choice. Um, and of course, includes, as I said, the active and attentive listening. So not just a rushing through a checklist, but actually taking the time to check in and um, make sure you're equipped with the resources available. And again, it minimizes the re-traumatization re that they may experience elsewhere. Uh, so some examples of helpful uh, you know, responses versus not so helpful. So saying stuff like, I can't imagine what you're going through. I can't imagine how you're feeling. How can I help? I'm sorry that happened to you. Goes a long way. Um, thank you for telling me. This must be difficult to talk about. I'm here if you need me. You're not alone. And some not so helpful examples. I know how you feel. We see this a lot. This happened to me too. You'll pull through. You'll be stronger after this. Did you? Why didn't you? You should. You want to avoid anything that will come across as what we call quote unquote victim blaming. So when you start asking questions like that, did you, why didn't you, you should, or I would have, um, those are not helpful responses. And then you don't wanna make promises you can't keep to them. Next slide. And so the importance of collaboration, um, as was stated earlier, I am the co-chair of the county's domestic violence task force, coordinated community response. So if any of you are interested in joining the task force, feel free to reach out to me. Um, so we're just asking you all, you know, now that you have this information, understanding you may be the first responder, that documentation is critical of these injuries uh, due to strangulation, understanding that they're not all going to be external injuries um, that you can document. So listening for clues about pressure to the neck, um, always warning victims of the dangers and the long-term ramifications of strangulation. And again, now that you have this information, share the knowledge, the resources, the diagrams. Uh, the Strangulation Prevention Institute has a wealth of um, information that you can access and send on to others. And we're also happy to send this information to you all. And again, knowing the resources. Next slide. And we want to make sure everyone understands that strangulation, um, there's a Florida statute in regards to strangulation, and strangulation is a third degree felony. And so, as we stated earlier, lots of times survivors may not want to, for a variety of reasons, move forward with cooperating with law enforcement, with the state attorney's office for prosecution. And so, um, the, the state should be able to move forward with the charges, but it's really critical that these incidents are documented both by law enforcement, by 
but also by medical personnel um, so that, again, the offender can be uh, prosecuted and it can be charged as a felony. Otherwise, oftentimes these are um, lowered down to misdemeanor charges. And so community resources, unfortunately, I don't have the time today to do a complete dive in on the spring services, but I'm always happy to come back and provide that. Uh, but we're the cert certified domestic violence agency in Hillsborough County. We have a 128 bed shelter, but what a lot of people in the community don't understand is that we're so much more than a shelter. So we have outreach programming, both in Tampa and Plant City. Um, we have a bunch of different special projects, including on high risk cases and child welfare dependency cases. And so just to access any of those services, please refer survivors um, to our hotline number. And an easy way to remember that number is 813-247-SAFE. And then the Crisis Center of Tampa Bay, you guys heard from Jen earlier. So they're the certified sexual assault agency here in Hillsborough County, and they have a wealth of services that they provide. And 211 is the community's uh, resource line, so you can access that as well. And then many people don't know, but the state attorney's office has a victim's assistance program. And so they have advocates on staff that if the survivor feels safe enough and is willing to move forward with charges of um, domestic violence or any type of crime, um, they can assist them, go to court with them, be a liaison between um, the survivor and um, the state attorney that's assigned to the case. And here we have listed the Florida and National Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault numbers as well. And here's our contact information. So feel free to reach out to any of us at any time. Thank you all so much for your time. I don't know if we have time for questions. We have a few minutes if you want to take the mic questions, um, there's time for them. Great. Do you guys have any questions? I mean, I think it's awesome to have both um, participants from the and Crisis Center here. So if you have questions, this is your time. I'm happy to take questions on strangulation workup or domestic violence workup as well. If you guys no must have covered it. <laughs> if there are no questions, we'll give you three minutes of your life back. And you can always get in touch with me and I can put you in touch with any of our speakers today. All right. Well, have a great day. Thank you, everyone.